This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, host of the show. Esophageal diseases are extremely common, and symptoms such as trouble swallowing, chest pain, regurgitation, and choking diminish quality of life. There can also be psychosocial effects for patients with these diseases. That includes hypervigilance, a heightened focus on symptoms, and symptom-specific anxiety, such as fear of choking. Identifying patients with these issues could help providers better treat their disease. That's according to a new Northwestern Medicine study published in the journal Gastroenterology. Dr. John Pandolfino is the senior author of this study, and he joins me today. He is the Hans Popper Professor and Chief of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in the Department of Medicine at Feinberg. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great to be here. Now, you specialize in diseases of the esophagus, and the esophagus is not a very big organ, but so critical to our daily lives. Tell me more about the esophagus and how a healthy esophagus should function. Yeah, so as you mentioned, the esophagus is a very small little tube. Um, It connects the uh, throat to the stomach. And uh, it, it is an important organ because obviously if, if you can't get food from your mouth into your stomach, you can't digest it, absorb the nutrients and live. And it's one of those organs that you, know, you take you know, for granted. Um, you're swallowing all day, um, saliva, just eating, drinking, taking a sip of water. And you really don't realize how amazing it is that we're able to get this food from our mouth into our stomach in a seamless way where you don't even notice. And the minute it goes awry, um, it's really disconcerting for people because, as I mentioned, this is just something that happens. And it's sort of like breathing. You know, you breathe all day. You don't really think about it. Um, but when it starts to go awry, you you, you really get scared. Um, and it, there's a lot of similarities between breathing and swallowing. And when you say go awry, what are the typical esophageal diseases that you see and treat? Yeah, so there's a couple different ways you can think about esophageal problems. Um, the way I like to think about of them globally is you either have a disorder where you're um, impeding forward flow. So there's either an obstruction or poor propulsion, and that's really affecting your ability to get the food down from your mouth into your stomach. And then there are disorders of retrograde flow, um, where you actually have reflux of contents that are either in your stomach up into your esophagus and your throat. And that's typically with re, uh, reflux disease or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Or you can even get regurgitation from your esophagus if, if food gets caught there. So it can actually go from your esophagus into your mouth. So it's really kind of a balance between, you know, getting good forward flow and antegrade motion and then preventing too much retrograde flow. Now, you're one of the world's leading experts, really, in treating these types of diseases. How did you get interested in studying the esophagus and treating patients with these issues? Yeah, there's a little bit of a joke around that, that uh, I I say to people that I stayed in my family business about (laughs) half of my family, I guess, are in plumbing and electricity. And, Ah. you know, the esophagus (laughs) is is essentially plumbing. Um, You know, you move things along a pipe, um, you remove obstructions, and you prevent backwash. And then there's certainly a lot of electrical activity that goes in terms of the neuromuscular uh, function, uh, a lot of um, electrical signaling um, and uh, muscle mechanics. So I sort of stayed in the family business in a way, um, maybe subconsciously, but I think it was really just my introduction in in gastroenterology. I I saw that it, it was a pretty prevalent problem that people had problems with their esophagus. And it was something that, you know, it made sense to me. It it was something that, you know, if if you could fix this, you could really dramatically improve patients' lives. And you really got your start uh studying this organ here at Feinberg and McGaw. Yeah, so I started here as an intern, uh, and I've been at Northwestern ever since I was an intern. And during my residency, I, I knew I wanted to do something that was procedure related, but not just procedures, and where I w- would be able to do diagnostics and also see patients in clinic. And GI was was really a, a really good um, subspecialty for that. When I got into g- gastroenterology, I met my mentor Peter Carillus, who was an esophageal expert also, and I just I just thought that the the way he thought about problems in the esophagus and the physiology was really interesting. And that's really what got me started. And now you've published hundreds of papers looking at different ways to treat these diseases. And you've just recently uh, published the paper we're going to talk about today that focuses on esophageal hypervigilance and symptom anxiety. Please explain those terms to me and what they mean in this paper and why you wanted to investigate it. 
Yeah, there, there are very important distinctions uh, between those and especially between esophageal hypervigilance and, and visceral hypersensitivity. Um, visceral hypersensitivity is when people can feel a physiologic event, which typically would be ignored by people, and they just sense it. They have a, a lower threshold for sensation, and that's kind of a physiologic thing. It may be due to nerve issues, you know, hypersensitive nerve. Esophageal hypervigilance is different. You may get hypervigilance from the hypersensitivity, but hypervigilance is really a central, a brain. Uh, central brain focus on the particular symptom where it literally becomes the focus of your attention consciously and 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 you're constantly thinking about your esophagus you think you feel things you're very worried about your esophagus and that really generates that symptom specific anxiety around that particular thought process and if you can break that thought process you can dramatically improve patients quality of life so why did you want to investigate it this is something that hasn't been published on much yeah i'm, I'm not a psychologist and you know when i was going through the process of trying to figure out why patients had worse symptoms with very similar physiology. So for instance i was actually getting a little frustrated i would fix people's physiology and they just weren't doing as well as I wanted them to do. Or I would see patients where I couldn't really find an overt problem that should be generating these kind of symptoms. And, you know, I was a physiologist and I thought I could explain everything with physiology. And then I met, in my mind, important person in my career, Lori Kiefer, um, who was a psychologist. And she was one of our new junior faculty. We were both junior faculty at the time. And we started talking about why people get symptoms and why people do poorly. And I really saw the benefit of the work she was doing already in, in, in irritable bowel syndrome and how I could apply that to the esophagus. So I didn't, you know, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. I wanted to take her concepts and the concepts of psychology and to create this kind of more, in my mind, complementary approach. And so you conducted this study and it really was a retrospective review of patient chart data where you looked for these symptoms. Tell me about the patients in this study and what you found. Yeah, so this particular study focused primarily on patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. And we've been looking at this in, in many different uh, disease states in the esophagus, like reflux disease, like motility disorders. And we've been finding this consistent trend. So we looked at over 100 patients who had eosinophilic esophagitis, which is a, a rare disease, but but becoming more common. And we're seeing it a lot more because I think we're just better at diagnosing it now. But it's a disease where the esophagus actually stiffens and be becomes inflamed and people get food caught and they get this really profound dysphagia. Sometimes they have to come into the emergency room and they get really anxious when they eat. So what we did was we identified these patients and we gave them our questionnaires and a couple of the questionnaires that we use focus on their dysphagia symptoms, the symptoms of, of food getting caught, and then some of these other symptoms like hypervigilance and visceral anxiety. And what we found in these 100 patients was that probably the biggest driver of their quality of life was really the hypervigilance and the symptom anxiety. I mean, the, the, the mechanics and physiology were important. It gets them in the door. It gets them to come in to see you. But in order to really get them living a better life, you really have to focus on the hypervigilance. Now, is there a healthy level of hypervigilance and anxiety that patients should have? That's a great question. And I think, I think it, it, we don't really know um, what the sweet spot is, but certainly you don't want to completely ignore your symptoms. I think, you know, that can obviously be to your detriment. And we see that sometimes in patients, they're almost borderline negligent, right? So you can be hypovigilant in a way, but, you know, you, you certainly don't want it to be something that drives your daily activities where, you know, you wake up in the morning and that's the first thing that you think of. So you, you really want to have this balance. So we don't really know what the sweet spot is, but certainly you don't, you definitely don't want to be on the ends of the extreme. So what did your findings suggest would help these patients? So that's also a great question um, that we didn't address in, in this particular study, um, but certainly we're, we're, looking at. And by actually finding that when we looked at symptom-specific anxiety, you know, being a predictor of their dysphagia symptoms, and dysphagia, once again, means trouble swallowing, these symptoms related to that, we really started thinking about what, what could we do for these patients. And, and over the years, we've been developing behavioral approaches for this. And these behavioral approaches can range from something like cognitive behavioral therapy, teaching people to, to get around this and, and, and think about self-management and calming themselves down, all the way to hypnosis, where we'll actually 
allow patients to train themselves to shift their attention away from that symptom so it's really not at the forefront of everything they do. So this mind-body connection in medicine and specifically in GI is something that you are really invested in? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, over the years, as, as I've tried to figure out how I can help my patients, I realized that I was only treating half of the patient. You know, I was treating the gut, I was treating the physiology and the mechanics. And although I still love doing that and think that's extremely important, if you don't fix that, you definitely won't make the patient better. But now I feel like I can actually help the patient in a, in a, a full complementary way because I can actually make them less scared. I can reassure them that, that this is not gonna hurt them and we can actually help them get on with their life. And, and that's really what gets people you know, back to at least close to normal because you want people to not care about this because what drives healthcare utilization isn't necessarily how bad the symptoms are. It's how the patient interacts with the symptoms. And that's what we're really trying to do now is affect that particular part of the, the symptom complex and the patient care journey. And you really get patients from all over the world who come to see you because of this comprehensive care. Yeah, I think, you know, not, not that there were many great things about the pandemic, but the pandemic did allow us to pivot and think about how we can treat patients in a much more broad experience and and improve access. And, and one of the things that we worked a lot on over the pandemic was how to deliver these behavioral therapies um, online and using visual cues uh, via Zoom and, and virtual platforms, and even conceptualizing some digital apps potentially that can help patients with this so that we can broaden the access. A lot of people have always said, well, you know, we don't have access to, you know, psychologists because they need to be somewhat trained in gastro psycho and um, psychology or psycho gastroenterology as we call it now. Um, but now because of this particular platform, we're able to deliver this to a lot more patients. I think the psychologists have been very much better about being proactive with this and, and there are avenues so that we can treat patients across state lines and even internationally. You know, I'm curious, you mentioned before that you are seeing more diagnosis of certain esophageal diseases, um, and maybe that's because you're able to catch these things um, and diagnose them where in the past um, that was a bit trickier. But in general, is there a rise or greater prevalence in these types of diseases that you're seeing? I think so. A lot of this can be related or, or traced back to obesity. Um, I think we're certainly becoming a much more obese country. And if you think about it, you know, that will certainly increase reflux disease. And when you're increasing reflux, you're injuring the esophagus. So even if you develop something else, there's two hits. You know, you may have more inflammation. You may have more sensitivity in your esophagus um, because of the reflux. Even if you treat the reflux, that may remain in some capacity. And also, when you're gaining more weight and you're increasing your intra-abdominal pressure, you're creating more of a, uh, a pressure gradient. And we're actually seeing people who are developing, you know, these small hiatal hernias from obesity, having high intragastric and intra-abdominal pressures. And, and we theorize that that may also be leading to some of this increase in dysphagia that we're, we're seeing in patients. I do think the eosinophilic esophagitis is a very interesting disease state because just like anything, when I was a kid, you know, I didn't see everybody with peanut allergies and all these different allergies, milk allergies. And now we certainly know that allergies are increasing and it might be, you know, there's this hygiene hypothesis, we're too clean and and we're not exposed to things. But I, th I think there's something to that. And what we're seeing is this, this parallel increase in eosinophilic esophagitis um, so that definitely is something that I think is tracking along the same lines as all of these new allergies that we're seeing. I'm wondering, uh, do you have plans beyond this study to continue looking at this issue? Yeah. So I think the next step with this is to really do true experimental model of augmenting, you know, or or improving the hypervigilance and doing that through these behavioral therapies. So currently, we just found out we got a really nice score on an uh, NIH grant proposal that should get funded. And what we're going to do is we're really going to test cognitive behavioral therapy as a mediator and modulator of symptoms by targeting hypervigilance. And the, the thought process is that we will hopefully show that if we reduce the hypervigilance, patient symptoms will improve without really a dramatic change in their physiology. So that would be really uh, the, the pivotal study that'll show this. But regardless, we know that the behavioral therapies work in these patients. We may not know the mechanism yet, 
And that's really, you know, what we're going to focus on over the next five years. Um, but we certainly know that the behavioral therapies are very effective for these patients. Well, thank you so much, Dr. John Pandolfino, for sharing the results of this study and your expertise today. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode of the Breakthroughs Podcast, check us out on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and leave a rating.